More in sixth grade. Welcome to Catechism, Lesson 36. We're moving on into the second commandment today. Uh, if you remember, on Wednesday we took on the first commandment, the most important commandment. Uh, you shall have no other gods. Uh, fear, love, and trust in God above all things. And we talked about it being the most important commandment for three reasons. One, Jesus just told us. That was the last passage we looked up. is the first and greatest commandment. Two, if I keep the first commandment, I'll keep them all. Because if God's number one in my life, I listen to him, and that makes me follow the other commandments. Three, if I break any other commandment, I'm also breaking the first commandment because I am placing myself above God. And so I'm also breaking that first commandment. Today we're going to take on the second commandment. And that is, what is God forbidden command in the second commandment? And we'll get cruising through it here. We'll look up... And start with Matthew 26, 69 to 74. If you have your worksheet sitting in front of you, we'll take out pretty much the whole first side. Okay, it starts this. Now Peter was sitting out in a courtyard, might be number one, and a servant girl came up to him and said, you also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. Also number two and number three. He denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Might be number four. Then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. Number five, he denied it again, this time with an oath. I don't know the man. Number six, uh, and then you can add to it. So number six is what did he do? He denied it. But how is it a little bit different for number seven? He added this oath to it. So this is like saying, I swear, I don't know the man. Okay, so that's how you're hitting number seven. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you were one of them. Your accent gives you away. Number eight. Then he began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. So verse nine, guys, is you've got to get the two things he did wrong. Okay, so number one, he's calling down curses, and number two, he is swearing. So guys, lots of times we use cursing and swearing in today, and we think it's using four-letter words. That is not cursing or swearing. Cursing is asking God to send somebody to hell, and swearing is asking God to be a witness. Now, if we understand cursing, guys, and asking God to send somebody to hell, we'd never do it, because God obviously doesn't want anybody in hell. But we do that all the time when we ask God to damn things. So you think how many times in America we utter that phrase of, God damn this. Now, I can use that properly, guys. I can say, God damns sinners to hell. But so often we use it inappropriately in asking God to do that, and we don't want to do that. Swearing is asking God to be a witness. Now, guys, God can't witness to a lie. So I shouldn't say any time in my life I swear to God because... Often when I'm saying those things, I'm telling a lie. And Jesus will give us some advice about how to handle those situations as we work our way through it. James 3.10, sorry, I clicked too far. He says this, Out of the same mouth comes praises and curses. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. I think we should say it, this could not be. This can't be. In other words, we're looking at Christians and we're saying, I don't get it. You go to church and you sing praises to God. And then you turn around and you say something horrible and let bad things come out of your mouth. Which one are you? Are you a Christian or an unbeliever? I would expect an unbeliever to use this word. I expect a Christian to use this word. And James is saying, it's coming out of the same mouth. And I don't know about you, but I look at my own life and say, so often I have good things come out of my mouth and it seems like 10 seconds later, here comes horrible things out of my mouth. And you're like, which one are you? Are you a Christian who knows to do the right thing or are you not? And so James is encouraging us, stop sending mixed messages with how you talk. Let's keep it on the right. And that's a major, major challenge for us. 1 Samuel 4, 11 and, uh, 1 through 11 gives us an example of um, understanding the second commandment. So guys, if you remember the second commandment, I'll pull it up for you here. When we pull up the second commandment, it says, we should fear and love God that we do not use his name to curse, swear, lie, or deceive, or use witchcraft. Now, we have a misunderstanding of witchcraft. When I was a kid, we had to use it superstitiously, give it a false belief. This is an example here that we're going to look at of what witchcraft looks like. 
Now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. The Israelites camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Aphek. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel, and as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. When the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord bring defeat on us today before the Philistines? Let's bring the Ark of the Lord's Covenant from Shiloh, so that we may go out with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. So the people sent men to Shiloh, and they brought back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Almighty, who was enthroned between the cherubim. Those are the angels that are on the cover of the Ark of the Covenant. And Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. When the Ark of the Lord's Covenant came into the camp, all of Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. Hearing the uproar in the camp across the way, the Philistines asked, What is all this shouting in the Hebrew camp? When they heard that the Ark of the Lord had come into the camp, they were afraid. A god has come into the camp, they said. Oh no, nothing like this has happened before. We're doomed. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. They're scared out of their mind. Then they give themselves a pep talk. Be strong, Philistines. Be men, or you will be subject to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and the Israelites were defeated, and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The Ark of the God was captured. Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were killed. Okay, guys, using it witchcraft or using it superstitiously is kind of like, it's kind of like idolatry. But, you know, when we think of an idol, we think of the golden calf a symbol for a different God. This is a symbol for my God. So I'm going to bring the Ark of the Covenant out there. I'm going to think this is a symbol for God, so he'll be with me in victory. And therefore, because I have the Ark of the Covenant, we can't lose. And obviously they lost. They lost 30,000 men that day, 4,000 men the day before. They lost the Ark of the Covenant. Eli's two sons were killed, as Samuel had predicted. It's a disaster. Okay, we, we can do that today, guys. I always think today uh, you'll see a lot of people in the sports field. So I think about a track star who is about to run a sprint. Lots of times they'll kiss the cross that they wear on their necklace as if kissing the cross is going to let them get first place. It's a superstitious belief. A lot of times when a football player scores a touchdown, he'll cross himself or he'll point up to the heavens. Now, there's nothing wrong with praising God, guys. But if in my head I'm going, if I pump my chest and then point to heaven, then God's going to let me catch another touchdown. That's superstitious. That's wrong. If I say, thank you, Lord, for giving me the ability to catch a touchdown, there's nothing wrong with that, guys. So you've got to understand where your heart is. I can't have an object and think by having this object, I guarantee God is going to bless me. So understand the how we use it superstitiously today. Exodus 20, verse 7, you know this is going to be the second commandment spelled out for you because Exodus 20 is where the commandments are recorded. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Guys, we misuse his name all the time. We have the OMG we throw out there all the time. We tell God to send things to hell all the time. We swear by God all the time. And he says, I'm not holding you guiltless. And so often like, I don't know what you're talking about. I can say it all the time. Nothing bad ever happens to me. That might be true, guys. Nothing bad on this earth might not be happening to you. That doesn't guarantee the future. I mean, in other words, God says, this is a sin against me. It needs to be forgiven. And so we need to make sure we repent of those sins where we're misusing God's name. Ephesians 4.29, I love this passage because some people think, well, if cursing is asking God to send things to hell and swearing is asking God to be a witness, what about all those other horrible terms or horrible words we have in America? Are those not sin? Paul tells us, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. So guys, we lump it all together. Anything that comes out of mouth that's sinful. The proper term for that, guys, is profanity today. And in our culture today, we don't even care about profanity. And it's so sad um, that we're okay with letting that stuff come out of our mouth. And what's even worse is many of us think that makes us big, bad, and tough when we use those words. As you get older, I hope you understand. I look at people that misuse those words and I call them weak. Profanity is the attempt of the ignorant and the weak to sound strong and powerful. I don't need to add 
those horrible words into my sentence to make you think I'm angry or you think I'm tough or any of that stuff. And so get that out of your mouth. What does he want coming out of my mouth instead? Only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs so that it can be a benefit to those who listen. We got to learn to use our mouth as a blessing. Too often we use it as a tear down. Now we'll talk more about talking properly in the um, eighth commandment. This is all with God's name, guys, in the second commandment. Matthew 5.37, we're in the Sermon on the Mount, and this is what Jesus says. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Okay, so guys, um, this is Jesus' answer, so I don't swear. Simply let your yes be yes, and your no be no. Everything else is from the devil. So I won the lottery last night. A lot of people say, no, you didn't. And I'll go, yeah, I did. I swear to God. Okay, if you didn't believe me the first time I said it, guys, you're not going to believe me as soon as I think I say, I swear to God. All it's doing is making me compound my sins. Now, there's a good reason why you might not believe me. One, I might have just told a crazy story like, Mr. Bauer, there's no way you won the lottery. So if I'm telling stories that sound really crazy, I should maybe expect people not to believe me. Number two, the other time that people don't believe us is they know we've had a history of telling stories. This is the boy who cries wolf. And so if I lie all the time and people are like, I don't believe you, and I think I have to swear to make people believe me, I should maybe self-reflect and say, I might be a liar way too often and people are rightly saying, I don't believe you because of this. So on your test, I'm going to ask you, hey, what's Jesus's advice so you don't swear? It's right here. Always let your yes be yes and your no be. In other words, always tell the truth. And then people will believe you when you tell something that might sound a little bit way out there. Okay? Matthew 15, 19, 15 9 says this. They worship me in vain because their teaching are merely human rules. Jesus is going after the Pharisees and he's yelling at them because he's saying, they think they're worshiping me, but they're really just doing human rules. They've taken away from God's Bible. They've added their own rules to it, and they think that makes them good. That's awful. That's not giving God credit for the word that he has, and so we can't do that. Question one, what does God forbid? I wrote this. God forbids us to misuse his name. Now, guys, there's a number of ways that I showed you when we looked at the classwork. I can misuse his name by one, cursing, two, swearing, three, lying, four, deceiving, and five, using witchcraft. But now, guys, when I lie, I told you I won the lottery. That's a lie. That's not a sin against the second commandment. That's a sin against the eighth commandment. This is lying by God's name. So lots of times we'll say um, different things. There's an example in the Bible where Absalom, who rebels against David, tells the story of, I made a vow to God to go worship him. Well, no, you didn't. But David lets him go because he said, I made this promise to God. So I can't lie by God's name. Um, sometimes we discipline little kids like, oh, Jesus is so sad that you just did that. Well, that makes it sound like Jesus is this bad guy who is crying because a kid sinned and can't forgive him. I mean, that's lying by Jesus' name. Jesus doesn't want to be portrayed that way. Jesus doesn't like sin, guys, but Jesus can forgive you. So we got to be careful how we do those things as we work our way through it. Let's get what we should do instead. We're in Luke 17. We just had this one last week in catechism class, guys, and it'll help you on the backside of your worksheet. It says, Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going to the village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance. They called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Okay, so I would write this down on... Number 10, how did they use his name properly? They called on his name, right? They asked him for pity. Uh, what did Jesus do when he saw them? He said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were healed. Your answer to number 11. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice, number 12a. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, 12b, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all nine cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give me praise but this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Guys, we got a great example. Three good examples. One, I call on Jesus' name. Two, I praise him. And three, I thank him. And we get all those examples in this story. 
Psalm 50, 15 is a great one to use, especially because it's going to answer question 13 for you. But Psalm 50, 15, hopefully some of you are recognizing it as memory work. It says, and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. Most people take this passage and think it's physical. So call upon me when I'm having a bad day. I went into the doctor and I'm nervous what it might be. So call to Jesus. Now, guys, there's nothing wrong with calling on Jesus when you're in physical trouble. But guys, God has never promised to deliver me from physical trouble. He's promised to deliver me from spiritual. So what I'm supposed to say is I'm supposed to call on God today. Why? Because I need the forgiveness of sins. God, I'm in trouble. I sinned. Will you forgive me? Yes, I'll forgive you. You're delivered. Thank you, God. You're awesome. Let me honor you, right? So that's really what this passage is getting at, guys. We can obviously use it for physical, but make sure you're focused on the spiritual with that. Hebrews 13, 15. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. Guys, we got to confess his name, number one. We got to say the praises he's done but we got to do it continually, nonstop, um, gives us the great example. Psalm 118, you'll recognize too, um, it's the number of times in the Bible, but it says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his love endures forever. We say this as our lunch prayer, guys, and it's just a good job for us to remind it. I just ate, it's proof that God is still good and he, his love still continues because I'm not starving to death. And a great example of making sure we thank God. So back to commandment two, what does he command? God commands me to use his name in ways that please him. What did that look like for my catechism? Call upon God's name in every trouble, pray to him, praise him, and give him thanks. And so you can see how we look up passages, guys, that put this all together for us and sums it all up real nice. Okay, truth of the day, what does God command and forbid? I wrote that down, God forbids us to misuse his name and commands us to pray, praise, and give him thanks. A great example for us on how we should be using his name properly as we work through these things. Okay, extra credit for today. I want your definition of swearing. So on the top here you write, swear equals ask God to be a witness. Okay, extra credit number two. The only time we are allowed to swear is if you are in court and you are telling the truth. Because when I go to court, they're going to say, do you swear to tell the whole truth so help you God? And I say yes. Now, if I lie, guys, that's a sin. But the only time it's okay for me to swear is when my court asks me to do it and I'm going to be telling the truth because God can witness the truth. God can't witness a lie. So you got your definition of what it is and then you got the example of when we're allowed to do it. Let's close it with prayer. Lord, your name is wonderful, and so often in America today, we just don't take, we just let it come flying out of our mouth all kinds of inappropriate ways, whether it's misusing your name, whether it's asking you to curse people or things like that. Lord, forgive us for those times and help us to use your name to pray, praise, and give thanks. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, have a great Friday.